morning, more than those, and welcome to another edition of Love and Daily. I'm your host, Indiakono, joined today by Sam Vasala. How are you, Sam? I'm fantastic. How are you? Um, it's been a pretty eventful past 24 hours, and that's exactly what we're going to be discussing on the show today. So, let's get into it. Our stories of the day. A petition to ban mass events and mass gatherings in Malta has, um, has garnered um, 10,000 signatures in 24 hours. Maltese journalists call for a national commitment to um, the free press and warn of a, of a rising climate of threats. Jason Atzapardi says using private emails as a public official should be made a crime um, punishable by imprisonment. Uh, rush to raise funds for Edwin Lopez's, the, the repatriation of Edwin Lopez's body back to the Philippines before he is buried in Malta. And Zabbar offers you know, ask children for their dream playground and promises to make them a reality. So let's get into it with the first um, story, the story on everyone's lips right now. Um, a petition to ban mass gatherings and mass events in Malta in light of the new, um, new recent rise in COVID-19 cases. What, what do you have to say about that, Sam? Indeed. So um, let's just recap on that. There's a petition going around right now. It's already reached 10,000 signatures. They aim to reach a 15,000 landmark soon. Um, this is all part of the mounting pressure uh, to cancel large-scale events after a cluster of 16 uh, patients was found in connection to a party at a hotel, a, th a weekend party. Um, as usual, Malta is divided on this. We have the medical community um, and uh, Malta's employee uh, ex organization wanting to ban these kind of events, these large-scale events. Then you have, on the other hand, uh, Malta's Chamber of Commerce saying, you know, go ahead with these events, we need them, go ahead with precautions. Our beloved Prime Minister, Ibrahim al Guerra says, you know, he won't let this fear uh, stay his course of action. Um, and the newly formed um, entertainment lobby is, is kind of finding the middle ground saying, you know, we can't afford to, to completely ban these events, but regulations need to be followed. Um, and enforced. So, I mean, I, I don't think there's one right way of, of thinking in this, in this situation. I mean, I'm, I'm sure following this public outcry, people are scared, but keeping in mind that we never officially, you know, the, the COVID-19 was, was always going to stay. We always knew this. There was always going to be these ups and downs like this. Um, and it's all about fine. No one really knows what they're doing. No. That's the end of it. And we all, we're all just figuring out I'm what's... Exactly, we're all just winging it. Yes, I agree. And um, obviously, it's perfectly understandable that people are a little bit concerned or quite concerned when, they, when you see a rise in cases as we did over the weekend. Um, however, although the situation is extremely unpredictable, it's important that there is some kind of, of strategy in place. And what I mean is that if we're going to start closing mass events, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but if we do, then what's going to happen if you know a COVID-19 case pops up at a restaurant and people start calling for a ban of restaurants, are we going to close them down as well? What if it's at the bar? We're going to close them down. Like, let's not forget that um, people's lives are at stake, people's livelihoods, and we shouldn't just be so cavalier and just throwing it to the wind. Um, obviously, we should, you know, take precautions as required. But in, you know, there are people's literal lives on the line here and um, we should avoid um, some kind of move or drive towards economic hardship. And another thing I'd like to say is um, I was quite disgusted at the way some people were you know, targeting the organizers and the guests of the party. You know, there were quite a lot of... This whole holier-than-thou kind of mentality, yeah, right? I mean, vicious comments, blaming them, saying, you know, you should have known, it's your fault almost that the virus is back and you know you cause the start of the second wave or the third wave or whatever um, an element of schadenfreude was there as well <laughs> let's not forget as in most of us have been going out socially m many um, people who are positive for the virus are asymptomatic so you literally don't know if the person if you have the virus or the person you're speaking to has it and it's only a matter of chance that the people we have interacted with, and at least for all we know, weren't, weren't positive. So let's be, let's a little bit of human decency won't hurt when, when discussing this 
topic. Especially human decency with journalists. <laughs> and that brings <laughs> us to our next story. Yeah, so the Institute of Mortgage Journalists, the IGM, has issued a statement last night um, calling for a national commitment to the free press. Uh, fair enough. And, they, and, they, and they're mentioning a number of aspects. Um, first of all, they're calling for anti-slap legislation. Um, SLAP, for those of you who don't know, stands for uh, Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation, which, me which, mean, which is the case when um, wealthy people um, sue journalists in foreign jurisdictions, not because they feel slandered or because they feel libeled per se, but because they want to um, burden journalists with excessive legal costs in foreign jurisdictions so that the journalists will eventually, will, you know, succumb to pressure before the case has even is even heard. So this is like using the law to to subvert democracy, which is absolutely horrendous and I can't believe this is still happening in the twenty first century. Um, they're also calling they're also warning about a rise of threats against journalists and the um, rise of harassment or some report which mentioned it. Um, do, you f do you feel threatened and harassed as a journalist? Uh, I've kind of, I, I mean, I know that it's part of, of the work that we do. We are in the public eye, you know, and, and, and um, our livelihoods are online. And so anyone behind a keyboard can essentially say what they want about you. I've been here for half a year and I've already had my nice share of lovely insults. Having said that, although I don't believe that every single one of them should be reported to, to authorities and so on, I do believe that we are too... Um, too easy, I feel, on, on, this, on the culture we have, especially in Malta, where you know, there's something that you don't agree with and you just decide to either dox them or, or reveal their, their private information online or just call them whatever word comes to your mind at that point. Um, especially besides being a journalist, as an activist as well, I've had my fair share of, of, of such threats as which um, nothing much has come of them from authorities. Um, so I do think that no, we shouldn't, you know, follow the Big Brother sort of road. But I do think that some kind of crackdown to to make people realize that this is not this is not the way you speak to people has to has to become. Well, yeah, we have to also remember though that on social media, um, people, you know, tend to be quite they can not not all not all people. I don't generalize, but people can be quite vicious when behind the screen because why? Because there's no implication. There's no no one can retort back. You know, there's a comfort of a lot of separation between you, so you can just say whatever you like, um, and um, sometimes um, they'll be quite nasty as well. And um, from an aspect of a journalist, I think the best strategy ultimately is resilience. You have to realize that you are in the public eye and that um, you will get, um, you will face these kind of comments, and you just have to realize that at, at the end of the day, most of them are just um, completely transient comments on Facebook. Who cares? And when you adopt that attitude, it's actually, it instantly becomes better. Obviously, um, issues like doxing and issues like death threats are something else entirely, but let's not get lost in, um, in, in just a silly Facebook comments, making fun of, of you or insulting you or things like that. Fair enough, fair yes. enough. So, moving on. Moving on. Should public officials be banned from using private emails for their work? Jason Atsapardi, Nationalist MP, thinks so and believes that it, could, it should be an imprisonable crime. Very debatable. So essentially, Jason Atsapardi took to Facebook to say that he has issued this um, private member's bill calling for, for a ban of uh, the private use of emails for public work by public officials. Essentially, reasoning that this would help tackle um, the disease of, of corruption, especially in Malta. We know that, uh, for example, Joseph Muscat used his emails up until January 2020 when he resigned. Um, I can't believe we're talking about this in 2020, especially since the, the, the highlight of the 2016 US um, elections. The, the biggest scandal was Hillary Clinton, um, you know, using her private emails for, for her work. And if you don't know, the big issue with this is that Essentially, once you step down from your role, um, you know, the state cannot trace um, your emails, you know, it essentially becomes your own private thing. Um, and can you imagine what we could have uncovered 
uh, so far, even more than we have in Malta, <laughs> if there was actually this ban. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, at the end of the day, like, should um, emails you send in your line of duty as a public official, um, for example, as a minister or head of, of department, um, you know, should they be yours? Are they yours, or do they belong to the state? Because hey, they belong to the state, which at, at the end of the day they do, because um, it's it's government work. Um, so should you, um, so should you then ban, go a step further and completely ban um, uh, public officials from using their private emails for work? I think you should. However, I don't think we should re rush to impose um, imprisonment, and I'll tell you why. Because um, you know, it's, it's, it, it could be a little bit easy to just focus on Joseph Muscat, right? And say, yeah, because you know, he was using his Joseph at josephmuscat.com um, email, fair enough. Uh, but you know, where is, where is this going to stop? What about you know, maybe we can ban, them, ban um, public officials from using uh, email, email uh, private emails, but you know, what about WhatsApp, for example? What they send or they speak to their colleagues via WhatsApp? Are we going to make that a crime as well? Punishable by jail? Mm, I, fair enough. Where, I, where's the line you draw? Yeah, where's the line we draw? I mean, we communicate through so many different means nowadays. Um, and while, yeah, there should be transparency on government decisions, we must be really, really, really careful not to sleepwalk into a state of complete big brother, big brother mentality where, you know, you want every single thing you say and speak to be monitored by the police because there is a serious risk of this going in that direction for all good intentions. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and <laughs> I'll have to be careful about that and um, let's see where this debate leads to. Um, moving on, um, there's a rush um, ongoing to raise funds to repatriate Edwin Lopez's body before he has to be buried in Malta. So, for those who don't know, Edwin Lopez is a Philippine is a Filipino national who moved to Malta a few years ago. He worked as a bus driver and was recently killed in a tragic uh, traffic accident when you know, his motorbike was involved in a collision with, a, with another vehicle. Um, now his family are trying to, obviously they're devastated, you know, your, your family member just dies like so tragically in a foreign country, and they're trying to raise funds to repatriate his body. However, they've been told it will cost uh, 4,000 euro and 4,785 4, euros, almost 5,000 euro in uh, flight costs and charges uh, and, and other costs, and you know, to purchase the coffin, other costs entailed. It's a lot of money to repatriate the body, but I actually think it's quite standard considering like, all the costs involved, but it really does speak to, um, you know, how challenging it can be to um, to repatriate a body once it's been once when someone dies in a foreign land. I can't imagine the family. You know, you're mourning, you know, a family member, and on top of that, you have to think about how you're going to afford, you know, bringing them back and having a proper burial in in, in the way that you'd like. I mean. Mm -hmm. We don't often talk about this because death is such a taboo, but death is expensive. You know, funerals are expensive, and and you know, th th his story is, is so is so tragic. I mean, Lopez came to Malta two years ago. He had dreamt of being a bus driver. You know, he was living out his dream, and life was cut short like this. We are in contact um, actually with his son, and if you would like to make a donation. Um, for the cause, we have written about it, and you can find all the details where you can um, send some money to help them repatriate his father um, in the article. If you just Google his name with um, love in Malta. Yes. Let's move on to a lighter story now, yes. and the last story. Uh, so, Zabbar Local Council let children design their dream playgrounds and is actually going to make them a reality, which is a super cool initiative. So essentially, Zabbar Local Council, uh, together with the government, submitted a call for children to design what would be the dream playground. Um, the, the, the results were the cutest thing I've ever seen actually, yes, zip yes, lines yes. and, and um, there were even solar panels, which I'm mm -hmm. saying, you know, these kids are so eco-conscious already, which is amazing. Um, there are now plans to take bits uh, from, from all of the designs and, and make this kind of um, 
dream playground on this massive stretch of land in Zabbar. There are actually six other projects around Malta who are going to follow this same model, which begs the question to me, why don't we use this model more? You know, why don't you get the community to be involved in these initiatives more, especially for young people who I feel don't have anything besides Parcheville or laying on the beach and not laying on the beach in winter because then it is too cold. Imagine what we could do if we submitted a call as to what can young people do, like what do you need to, to express yourself, different means, instead of just, okay, now I'm 17, what is there to do? I'm going to go binge drink in Portugal. And I think it's a great way of um, fostering a sense of belonging in, in, in a community, you know, before, you know, head, before engaging in a project, you, know, you start by actually consulting, you know, people who are interested in this case. Children, I mean, it's obviously it's, it's really sweet. So they have to see these children just designing their ideal playgrounds, um, and hopefully, it's you know some of their dreams do actually get taken on board, which I'm quite sure they, I'm quite sure they will. To be, it would be a really shock if they didn't actually do it. <laughs> they just did that for a show. But anyways, that was all from us. This was Love and Daily. Be sure to follow. So loveandmalta.com for the latest news in memes and, and um, investigations and, and anything in between and have a full day of loving.